this morning.
or you're new here, we would love for you to come by and stop up at the Welcome Center up there if you have any questions or just to come say hi. We would also invite you to fill out the communication cards. They'll be either in the pew in front of you or behind you if you're in the front row, right next to the hymnals. And you can drop it either at the Welcome Center or at one of the contribution boxes that are very up at the back of the sanctuary. If you are not receiving the church news electronically yet, but you would like to, you can sign up again at the Welcome Center. For Children's Church, if you have kids ages 4 to 11 or 3, if they're potty trained, you can sign them up at the nursery, but make sure you do it before the service starts. And uh, they will be released back into the foyer during the service. Uh, if you would like to make a contribution, the boxes are again located by the sanctuary doors at the back, and we thank you for your financial support. For upcoming events, the youth Wednesday night activities will resume on September 8th, 6.30 p.m. and every Wednesday on from there. Yes! <laughs> and there is game of Bunko on Friday, September 10th, 6.30 p.m. in the fireside room. This is open to everyone, bring snacks to share. The September newsletter is also now available. Print copies are again at the Welcome Center for those who don't receive it by email, and it can also be found on the church website, which is lynchwood.org. Thank you, thank you, Emery. I tell you, my, uh, my daughters have left me. They live a long ways away, and I'm uh, trying to see if I can adopt her. Uh, I've, been, I've been told by others in the church that they've already got dibs on her to be her, their grandchild. So, uh, but uh, it's great to see our youth and uh, all that. I just want to finish up um, as we uh, go to the Lord in prayer. You know, it's been a very uh, perilous time in in uh, the world and everything. And I would encourage all of us to take a moment right now, however we prepare, to prepare our hearts, uh, get our hearts right for this service. So let's uh, all take a minute and then I'll lead in corporate prayer. this day that you have given to each of us. We thank you for this congregation, Lord, and we thank you for each person that is here, Lord. And I just pray right now that you will bless this service, that the Holy Spirit will envelop this service, that we will see you and feel you and know you are real, Lord. I just pray a special blessing on Pastor Brian as he gives the words that we need to hear, Lord. Just bless him and his family. Bless this congregation. We will give you the praise no matter what. In your name we pray. Amen. 
Would you please stand? Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. It washes white as snow. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus.
your side so heaven is real and death is a lie i want to hear voices of angels above singing as one hallelujah holy holy god almighty great i am who is worthy gun beside thee god almighty great i am i want to be The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O God. 
The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O God. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O God. If there was ever a time in our lives, Heavenly Father, when we need to focus on the truth behind these words, it is surely the day in which we live at this point in history. Many around the world, our Father, are struggling with what's happening in Afghanistan. That's thousands of miles away, but there you have many people in that country, Lord. Some will be martyred. Give them the faith and courage they need to stand true as they make the ultimate sacrifice of their lives for you and your word. Be with their families. Give them comfort. And that some will be delivered, Lord, miraculously. We pray for them as well. The ones who were delivered, you don't love any more than the ones who make the sacrifice. But we lift those people who belong to you and so many others. Perhaps others, Lord, because a great, a great revival is happening in that land. Many others who will be drawn to you in days to come because your spirit and your word are at work there. I want to pray for the ranchers and the farmers, our Father, throughout the West who are struggling and may well lose their farms and their livelihood and their homes because of the drought. Some will be rescued, but others will lose everything in a financial way. We want to pray for those people, our Father, in the southern states of Louisiana and Mississippi and, and bordering states of Alabama and Tennessee and others who are facing a Category 5, 4 or 5 hurricane this morning, right now as we pray. Some will lose their lives, Lord. Some will be believers and some will be non-believers. We lift all of these people up to you in prayer and pray for your divine help. We need the words of the scripture to come to life, our Father, in the hearts and lives of people down there in the South. As they mark the 16th anniversary of Katrina. It's a tragic thing, Lord. We think of the people, our Father, whose, whose homes and livelihoods have been ravaged by the wildfires that have swept through the West. Some of them were believers, Lord. Some were not. You care. And we care. Our Father, we pray for the families, for parents, for children, for young people who are going back to school this week. And there's a lot of anxiety and a lot of fear, a lot of trepidation. Oh God, we need your help. we look around
around us in this city, but it's not just in our city. And we see so many young people who've been shot and killed over the last few months. And I would say to you, Father, and I think probably most of us in this room would say, in all of my lifetime, I never thought I would see something like this in this country. The loss of those lives, the grief in those families, Father. When I saw Corey T Pritchett, Lord, on television, I thought about his father and what a wonderful ministry he had. And I pray your blessings on Corey today to help him, Lord, in his ministry. And then, Lord, in all of our lives, there are personal issues that are really too personal to talk about in a public way. And we lift those up to you as well. These surely are days, Lord, that try our souls. I would say, Lord, that they're the most trying days that most of us have ever experienced in our lifetime. And that's true for believers and unbelievers alike. We need courage, our Father, for the living of these days. We need faith that overcomes. We need perspectives that come for you as we listen to the news and watch the sights and sounds. For you are at work, Lord, in more places than we can possibly know. And you are working out your purposes for the history of mankind. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. We need wisdom, Lord, as we make our decisions. Help us to learn how to listen to, listen to the peace that you promised to give to those who belong to you. And let your peace rule in our hearts. We need patience, Lord. There's so much impatience around us. And sometimes we're impatient with ourselves. But we need to learn how to have patience, our Father, in this world and kindness. Oh God, it's such a cruel age in so many ways. Fill our hearts with the kindness that comes from your Holy Spirit. Kindness is such a marvelous and wonderful gift, our Father, that we can bestow on people around us. Instead of sharp words, Lord, Help us to have soft words that speak of love and friendship and understanding and helpfulness and unselfishness. Lord, we need love, the kind of love that covers a multitude of sins. Because there sure is a multitude of sins around us. And some of them touch our own lives. But your love covers a multitude of sins. We need the peace that passes understanding. We need the power of your Holy Spirit that can neutralize the fear that grips our whole country and indeed the whole world. You do not want us to be overwhelmed with fear. We need you in our lives. Jesus, we would say to you this morning that we know that you overcame the world and the flesh and the devil 
You overcame the penalty and the power of sin. You overcame the grave and death and hell. And you did it for us. You didn't have to do it for yourself, but you did it for us. And now you're at the right hand of God the Father. And even now you're interceding for us. You're the author and finisher of our faith. And we can trust you, Lord, from the beginning of our faith and the intervening time all through eternity. Now, Lord, bless our pastor today. You know he's weak physically. But we ask that you would nourish him with your love and your spirit. And then, our Father, he will be able to speak words that nourish us. And I want to say to you, Father, that these things that I've asked, I'm asking them for all of us, Father. But I say to you, Lord, that we will glorify you in the way you answer these, these requests. Because we know that it's impossible for us to live in any way that, doesn't, that, that glorifies you unless your spirit and your word are alive in our hearts. One thing more, Lord. Remember Donna Helmas and the physical ailments, Lord, that she's battling. Thanks again for the privilege of prayer. And we've uttered these, prayer, these requests, Father, in your son Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Would you please stand? I see the Lord seated on the throne, exalted in the train of his robe, fills the temple with
as Dr. Liu was sharing the last several weeks, uh, shared that word holy, and that holy word holy has been um, circulating. Children, you're dismissed. I know, I'm not paying attention to you, I apologize. But, um, you know, we, we worship a mystery. And I actually heard a teacher share not too long ago on the holiness of God, and we have, you know, holy, holy, holy. And it's <clears throat> not just once, not just twice, but this repetition of holy, holy, holy. And it's the throne room of God and, and the angels of heaven and both e eternal beings and ourselves crying out, holy is the Lord. And really what it, what it is, he, he says, it's the otherness of God. This this, it's, it's beyond righteousness, it's beyond moral character, it's, it's even beyond perfection. It's this mystery of God that is, that is beyond anything any of his created creatures can grasp. And so all they can say is, it's holy. It's greater than anything we could possibly imagine. I'm worshiping a mystery that is beyond anything I can understand. Not once, not twice. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Will you turn with me to Mark's gospel this morning? <clears throat> Mark chapter 8. Good morning. It's good to see you too. I, I was just, I told Jackie, I'm so grateful you didn't quit. <laughs> So we went, on, uh, we went on a family vacation. My wife and I went on a 15-year 15, 15 anniversary, which is coming up in September, but never get married in September. Bad idea. And then after that, I was at Camp White Branch, and then we all got COVID. So I've been out of the office for basically almost pretty close to a month. So thankfully, Jackie was there to hold down the fort and didn't quit on us. So, uh, Mark chapter 8, verse uh, 35 and following. Jesus says, whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospels will save it. Here's the question. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Our Heavenly Father, these words that Jesus spoke to his followers that day, these questions that he asked, may they be just as real in our hearts today as they were for them. As we wrestle with the value of that which is temporal versus that which is eternal, illuminate our hearts this morning, Lord. Show us what is true and teach us what has value. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I do want to thank Brother Lou. He's not here. He's very popular. He is at Rockwood, I believe, this week. It's become a little tradition for us to have Lou share every August, of which I am very grateful, and I know that you guys are very grateful too. And if you have not heard all three of those messages, go to the archives. They're all there. You need to listen to them. Um, dwelling in Psalm, Psalm 100, but really what he was bringing to light. Three words, thanksgiving and praise and worship. You know, especially a lot of times in the world and in church, we have words that we kind of use interchangeably. In the church, we use the words like mercy and grace, and we kind of interchange them, or we'll use the word righteousness and holiness, and they'll kind of interchange, or believe and have faith, and then they're kind of, they kind of say the same thing, but they're distinct. And when you begin to know the difference between those, right, it helps us. It gives us a greater depth and a greater understanding. And really what Dr. Liu did over the last three weeks is he showed us the difference between words that we use interchangeably but that are distinct for a reason, of what it means to give thanks, of what it means to praise, and what it means to worship. And I really believe that's going to help us a lot if we can really begin to understand what it is we're invited into as the people of God what it is, the reason for which we come together and we gather. You know, this is not a football game here, 
right? It's not that entertaining. I'm sorry. I'm just not that good yet. But my hope is that you don't come here because you expect to be entertained. I hope you're engaged, but I don't really care if you're entertained, entertained because the purpose is not to be entertained. You know, this isn't, an, this isn't a seminar. I hope you come and learn, but I hope you don't just leave with knowledge. You know, this is not just a religious ceremony, and I hope it's a commitment that you have, but I hope it's not just a tradition. Something happens when the people of God gather together. And that was really, again, I'm just recapping and just thanking Dr. Lou for sharing um, because it's so important we recognize why it is and what we've come to gather for. And as we're going to talk about today, the treasure of gathering together. I want to talk about that for a minute. So we are going to jump back into the Sermon on the Mount. Everybody says, yes! All right, it's only week 24. We're like halfway through, okay? It's great. So I will not give you the full recap. Everybody say, thank you, Brian. Uh, You're so welcome. All right, so, but it's all in the archives. It's all in the archives. If you're bored for a couple weeks, you can go back and listen to every single one of them. But just a reminder of what the the Sermon on the Mount is. If you had the privilege of learning under a rabbi in Jesus' day, um, we've talked about this before, but essentially what, what they would do is that they would summarize a big truth into a small sentence. And so the, the rabbi would teach you for, you think I talk long, I mean, four hours, six hours, all day, two days. And then they would say, all that to say, okay, therefore, love your neighbor and pray for those who persecute you. I'm taking a really big truth and I'm wrapping it up into one sentence. And that sentence actually contains the whole lesson. You can call it, it's similar to a, to a title, right? What comes to mind when I say, gone with the wind? Frankly, my dear, yeah, right? Really, really long movie that you need all day to watch, okay? Uh, what comes to mind when, you say, when I say Star Wars? Things start flashing in your brain? Or The Jungle Book or Aladdin for some of you guys. You know, it, there's this title, but it really unlocks a whole story for you. It unlocks everything that's there. And this is how the rabbis taught in their day, is that they would teach a truth at length, and they would give it this short little title, and then they would use this title, this, this paragraph, and they would revisit it again and again and again as it would appear in life. And so, actually, when you read the Sermon on the Mount, I challenge you to almost read it as a glossary. I can't pronounce that word. As a glossary, this beginning of the book that says everything that's going to follow. Because it's this collection of teachings that Jesus had, and yes, he probably, he, he spoke it in one sermon, he spoke it again and again, he was a traveling preacher, okay? But there are these, there are these short paragraphs, these short sentences, these phrases that as a rabbi, as he went through his ministry, and as you see the other four books of the Gospels unfold in the story of Jesus, you actually get to go back and say, oh, there it is. That's what he was talking about. It, it just became real in real life. And so, for example, when, when Lazarus, Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead, right? Jesus waits the extra, the extra couple days. He gets there. Lazarus has been in the groove, the, the tomb for four days. And, of course, Mary and Martha, the, brother, the sisters of Lazarus, come out, and they're devastated. They're weeping. They're wailing. Even Jesus himself weeps with the mourners. And then what happens? He says, let's go to the grave. Move that stone. Oh, but Lord, he stinketh. That's a great line in the uh, King James. He stinketh. Lazarus, come forth. What happened to the tears when Lazarus came forth? And you can just see the smile on Jesus' face, right? As he looks to his disciples, he says, remember? Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Remember, it's the redeeming character of God. Don't forget it. Don't forget it because it's a promise that you can take to the bank. Or there was the, the time in which the Canaanite woman came and she was begging Jesus to, to, uh, to cast out a demon that was in her daughter and Jesus actually ignores her. This is a hard, hard place in Scripture. He ignores her and she presses more and Jesus says, I didn't come for you. I came for the lost children of Israel. And she says, but even the dogs eat the scraps under the table. 
And, and what she's referring to is that the, the master of a house would have his family seated at the house, but he, the dogs would eat the scraps. They didn't have dog food, no pet goes, right? So they, didn't have, they would eat the scraps, and what she's saying is, I know I'm not at the table, but every good master even takes care of his pets. And Jesus is so moved. I can just see him turning to his disciples and saying, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. When the disciples returned, Jesus sent them out ahead of him into the towns to, to prepare the way. And uh, they went out, and Jesus gave them the authority over demons. He gave them the authority over sickness. And they came back, and they began to report everything that they had, they had done and how even demons were being cast out in the name of Jesus by the authority that he gave them. And I can just see Jesus looking at them and saying, I told you, you are the salt of the earth. I told you, you are the light of the world. Do not, hold, do not, do not conceal your light. And so these teachings, these, these short sentences, these paragraphs, these thoughts, Jesus as a rabbi again and again as his gospel and as his life unfolded would be bringing people back to these, remember what I said? Because the truths of Christ, they're not just philosophical, they're not allegorical, they're not philosophical, I already said that, they're not abstract or hypothetical, they are real and they are practical and they come to life. And so this morning, we're jumping back in to the Sermon on the Mount in a statement that many of us know so well. You could probably recite it by memory. But turning to Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says this, verse 19. <clears throat> Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither rust, moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And my mind was circulating this week about all the times in which this statement had to have reappeared in the life and the ministry of Jesus. And I want to, tell you, I want to share one story with you. We're going to do it in just a little bit. But before we get there, um, what comes to mind? What's the first thing that pops into your mind when you hear the word treasure? What's the image? Huh? Gold? Valuable? What else? There it is! Pirates! Fred and I are on the same page, okay? I'd say, arr, yeah. The, uh, uh, I'm not going to go there. All the pirate jokes. Okay, but pirates was the, is the first thing. Like, I cannot think about treasure without thinking about pirates. And pirates have been totally Hollywoodenized, we get that, okay? And, but, you know, we, and so we have this picture of pirates, and they got the big beards and the peg legs and the eye patch and the sword and the hats. But the thing that's true about pirates is what? That they are obsessed with, they have this goal of obtaining and hoarding treasure. And so they get their chests, you know, and they have their secret islands and the maps with the X that marks the spot and all the paces and everything how to get there because their life is consumed with treasure, with acquiring and securing treasure. Now, I know pirates are thieves, and they're probably not the best people in the world to try to emulate, but there's something about just the imagery, especially the Hollywood imagery, but there's something about the imagery of the nature of piracy that actually reflects the nature of the human heart. And that is that we are all treasure seekers. We have different treasures, but there's something in the human nature that we are on a treasure hunt in this life. We're searching for something of great value. I don't know how many of you guys remember my friend Josh Zarzana he was here for about a year while he attended Multnomah Bible. He's currently um, actually a military chaplain in Washington, D.C. right now. Uh, he, wrote a, he wrote a book about uh, his, his father's divorce of his mother and, and how that impacted him. It's called the, the Son Who Chases the Father. But in that book, and I'm going to butcher the quote because I loaned the book, and I don't know exactly what the quote is, but he wrote, he wrote a, a statement that said, you know, life what I write down here, it says, life is the pursuit of finding that which is most valuable. Life is the pursuit of finding that which is most valuable. We all have this inner pirate. Everybody say, "R." All right. Who's your favorite pastor? 
Dan R. in Brister, okay? <laughs> okay, sorry. I'm... We don't slit throats to get it. We don't steal it, right? But we're in a search. We have this quest of that which is most valuable, and we're constantly being pulled by all these things around us saying, pick me, pick me, pick me. I am of so much value. And we're constantly weighing the treasures that we possess against that which we don't. And so it's, it's small and it's big, right? You, you go to the sandwich shop and you look at the sandwich and you're like, is that sandwich worth more, the, more to me than the $5 in my pocket? And I got to choose. You know, going to the gas station, the, I, I filled up my truck yesterday and the guy's like, do you want a receipt? I was like, please don't show me. Uh, I got to weigh I got to weigh it out now, right? It's like, man, I'm not sure if this is worth the sacrifice anymore. You know, have you ever been stuck between do I hold on to the job I have or take hold of the one that's offered? It's this releasing of one thing to gain another. How many of you guys have had to sell a house and buy a house? That's a hard thing to let go of that which you have in your hand to reach for something that which you don't yet possess. You know, how many of us have given up our freedom for children? <laughs> you make some sacrifices along the way, don't you? Life isn't the same when children come along. Where you have to choose between staying with a family member who's in crisis or going on a family vacation. You know, one of the, one of the great tragedies of what, speaking of Hollywood, of what they have done is that they have poured stories into us that make us think that leaving the one that we've promised ourselves to and seeking the one that we love is a greater good. And we have people that, get, that are in marriage covenant and they'll look at another and say, the other is a greater treasure than what I already possess because we're on a treasure hunt and we have to have the greatest treasure and we get lied to. You know, life is a treasure hunt. We're, on, we're constantly seeking that which has the greater value. And if, along the way, there's things that we have to let go to attain it. If, one of the places that Jesus mentions this, also in, in Matthew's gospel, uh, Matthew chapter 13, if you just turn over a couple pages. 44 and 46, Jesus tells us a couple parables. He says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found, and then he hid it again. And for the joy over it, he goes, and he sells all that he has, and he buys the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant. He's seeking a fine pearl, and upon finding one pearl of great value, he went, he sold all that he had so that he could buy it. Jesus recognizes there's something in the human spirit that's on a treasure hunt. It's seeking that which has value. And there are things in this life that have so much value, we're willing to relinquish almost anything to take hold of it. And so in this, in this statement that Jesus has in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, don't store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. And he goes on to say, for where your treasure is, church, there your heart will be also. You know, I think the thing that I want to bring out today as we jump into this story is that we know that we're on a treasure hunt, but sometimes we really struggle, we get very confused as to which thing has greater value. We struggle as flesh and blood to discern what is truly of the greatest value. Turn over a couple more pages to Matthew chapter 19. You will know this story as the uh, story of the rich young ruler. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all bring this story to light. Uh, but starting in verse 16, chapter 19, verse 16, it says, And someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? Now, again, like I said, this is mentioned in all three Gospels. We know a little bit about this man. But really what we have here is a real-life treasure hunter. Think about it. 
He's a real-life treasure hunter. We know that this man is probably pretty much at the top of his game. He is a ruler. He is, we understand, to be young, has a lot of life in front of him. He's probably got all the girls. He's probably got all the money. He has power. He has influence. He has the things that the world holds as valuable. And yet, where do we find him? We don't find him back at his castle, right, at his whatever, living it up, saying, look how wonderful it is. We find him having left his home, left his luxury, seeking Jesus, seeking what? Seeking something of greater value than what he has. There's still something that's calling him, that's saying there's more. And so here we have this guy who, uh, at least metaphorically speaking, he has all the world has to offer, and yet he's still hunting for a treasure. Many years ago, I heard a, a speaker share something that has always just resounded in my mind, and I think I've shared it with you before, but it totally bears repeating, and that is that the greatest, the greatest desperation in life or the greatest disparity of life is not when you lack and wish you had. It's when you have it all and realize you still lack. That's the greatest disparity because we can live with this lie when we lack. We can live with this lie that if I just had a little bit more, then I would be happy. If I just can have this, then. And we get this lie in our mind that gives us hope that if we can simply attain a little more. There was a, a study done in the 1990s where they basically said, they asked how much people make and then how much they would need to make to be happy. And they found consistently that if someone made $40,000 a year, they only needed $80,000 to be happy. But the person that made 80,000 only needed 160, and the person that made 160,000 only needed, what, 320. There was something about, if I could just double it, and it didn't matter where they were on the scale. Was it Rockefeller that they said, how much is enough? He said, just a little more. You see, when we lack, we can believe this lie that there's something there. But what happens to the people that receive it all and they realize it's a lie? What happens when you have tapped out everything the world has to offer and then you realize, I still haven't found it? Your hope is gone. This is, if you want to read the book of Ecclesiastes, this is what he discovered. He, he, he discovers, this, he says, I've, I've kept myself from nothing. I gave myself every pleasure. I gave myself to wisdom. And what did I discover? Vanity, vanity, as if chasing after the wind. C.S. Lewis talks about you know, giving, the, there's this treasure that's out there that this world cannot fulfill for you. There's something in the human heart that seeks something that's eternal. And, and I think, you know, as, as we read in Ecclesiastes, God has put eternity in our hearts, but he hasn't put it in our hands. There's a treasure that this world cannot fulfill, and Jesus touches on this. You see Jesus, he says, distinctly in, in, in his sermon, he says, look, there's two kinds of treasures. Remember this. There's two kinds of treasures. There's treasures on the earth, and there's treasures in heaven, and yes, they're different. And so here we have a man who is looking for something he has not found, though he has every resource in the world to attain it. The modern-day, present-day treasure hunter. And so he comes to Jesus, and Jesus actually meets him with good news. He says, what do I need to inherit eternal life? And the first thing Jesus says is, is kind of good news. Verse 17, Jesus says, why are you asking me about what is good? There's only one who is good, but if you wish to enter into life, keep his commandments. And he said, which ones? Jesus says, well, do not commit murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said to him, all these things I've kept, all these things I've kept. And, and really what we see here, and we're going to spend very little time here, I just want to touch on it. But what Jesus actually just told him, he says, you've actually already found a part of the treasure. You've actually already found a part of the treasure because part of the treasure is the righteousness of God. You know, um, as God's people, one of the things that we recognize as we mature, just how precious the righteousness, the moral character and goodness of God is. When you're a child, 
it's just rules, right? Oh, I got to follow the rules. Mom and dad told me to follow the rules. It's, you know, it's the rules. And then when you're a teenager, it's oppression. I can't believe the Lord hates me so much that he would not want me to do this. Like, this cannot be the God of the universe. He does not love me. I got to do my own thing. And then when you become an adult, you're kind of like, what did that say? I think I need to start raising my kids in the church because this guy's pretty smart. Because you begin, you know, to understand how the world works and that righteousness matters. And then when you become a senior, it becomes a treasure, doesn't it? The, whole, the, the righteousness of God just becomes a treasure. And, and Jesus looks, he says, you've already found part of it. You've found to love the goodness of God. And, and if he would have, he could have left at that point. He could have he been like, sweet, I'm on it. But he knew that even though he had found part of it, he was missing still something more. He was missing still something more. And so he I don't want to say he makes the mistake, but he makes the mistake of pressing it a little further, and he says, all these I've kept from my youth, and then what does he say? He says, what does he say? All these I've kept from my youth. He says, but what do I lack? Is that what he says? All these I've kept from my youth, where am I at? Thank you. All these, what, yeah, what am I still lacking? Thank you. What am I still lacking? And Jesus says, if you wish to be complete, if you wish to be made perfect, the fullness of this treasure, okay? Go, sell your possessions, give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Of all the statements that Jesus made, I find this to be one of the most challenging statements that Jesus ever made, especially for people of affluence. One of the most challenging statements that Jesus ever made. Because Jesus, he, this, this man comes to Jesus and he calls him good, and Jesus says, why do you call me good? And really, this, this kind of this inner dialogue of, you believe I'm God, don't you? you? You believe that I hold the secret to eternal life. You know who I am, don't you? And then Jesus takes that challenge one step further, and he he, he says this. Think about it this way. Do you really believe that the treasure that I have is greater than the one that you have? Do you really believe? See, you've you've got everything the world has to offer. I'll make you a deal right here, right now. I'll make you a deal. You pick your treasure. You can have everything the world has. You own it right now without me. Or you can have me without anything in the world. Do you really think that I have the greater treasure? That is a hard question. Do we really believe, right? Does this man really believe? He comes to Jesus, calls him Lord, says you are good, says you have the secrets to eternal life. And then when Jesus calls him out, he says, do you really believe the treasure that I have is greater than the one that you have? You know, I, I wonder if Jesus, if the disciples, they were sitting around and they were looking at it and they were going, does he realize, can he see that he is in the presence of the pearl of greatest price? Can he see it? Or deep down inside is his heart really married to the reality that he actually believes he has a greater hope of securing his own treasure than God has of giving it to him. I was having a friend, a conversation with a friend yesterday, and, and one of his friends was a three-way phone call. Really fun conversation. Uh, one of the things that we mentioned is the irony of, of God's people when we lack faith and when we lack trust. Because we all say, well, we're going we're gonna to spend eternity with Jesus. Now, think about this. I'm willing to trust my eternal destination and my eternal life to God. All of it, like forever. But tomorrow, no, 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 I don't trust you with tomorrow, y'all. Mm-mm. No, I need to control that. I'm willing to trust him for eternity, just not tomorrow. 
Big words, preacher. I know, I'm just as human as you are. But does it make, it, does it make sense, right? We have this cognitive dissonance in our brain where we say something's of great value, but in reality, we find ourselves so much like the rich young ruler that really question, is the treasure of heaven greater than the treasure of earth? Is what God is offering me greater than what I can purchase for myself with the resources that I have already obtained? And Jesus comes here, he's in, going back to, verse, to chapter 6, he says, I want you to see there's two treasures. There's a treasure that's fading away, and there's a treasure that's going to last, and you need to know which has the greater value. There's a treasure that's fading away, and he talks about moths, and he talks about rust. You guys ever lost a garment with moths? I haven't. But I did buy inner tubes once for Camp White Branch that for like floating on the river, and they left them in the attic, and the mice ate them up. That's kind of the same thing. <laughs> That's a real great investment. Um, you know, moths are something that comes in and prematurely destroys something that should have a lot of life in it. And rust is kind of the same thing, but the opposite. It's something that just runs its course. Eventually, it wears out. It's thermodynamics. It, it falls apart. And Jesus says, whether it takes a long time or whether it takes a short time, it's all futile. It's all going away. No matter what treasure you have here on earth, there's coming a day when it's no longer going to be a treasure. And then he goes on to say, all of our wonderful friends, back to the pirates, people are going to take it. And I think we've all been ripped off at some point in our life. And so it, it brings me back to this question that we asked at the beginning, the question that Jesus asked out of Mark chapter 8, he says, what good does it do for a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? And we see this man who comes to Jesus. Jesus says, do you believe that the treasure that I have is greater than the treasure you have? Let's go right now. Do you believe it? And he puts his head down and he walks away sad because he doesn't really believe it. But he also knows that the treasure he has is not what he wants. I wonder if we had the opportunity to interview him today, provided maybe he had a heart change later on. We don't, we don't know his story. But I wonder 2,000 years later if we had an opportunity to sit down with him, what he would say now about his investment. In that moment, his greatest treasure was his life. I wonder what he would say about it now. Treasures have a way of changing as we age, do they not? Do you value the same thing now that you did when you were younger? When I was, um, let's see, I was 21, 22 years old, and I acquired the love of my life. It wasn't Sheila. It was a Land Cruiser. Um, and for a couple of years, I, I restored this classic Land Cruiser, some of you guys know. It's now the biggest shelf in my grandma's garage. Uh, I haven't driven it in years. And, you know, I, I worked my tail off on it. And I loved it. It was beautiful. I did all the work on it, new motor, totally restored it, everything. All the way up to quite literally like two days before my wedding, I got it put back together after paint because I needed to drive away in my really cool rig, you know. I just worked my tail off to get it done. After I got married... Suddenly, priorities change. <laughs> so I've owned it for, what, 15 years, 16, 17 years? The value of it from the world standards has, I don't know, doubled in value, tripled in value. It's worth a stupid amount of money. No, I won't sell it to you. Um, but its value to me has diminished incredibly. It's interesting. The world holds it in greater value, but I hold it in less value. It's once, you know, once you get married and once you start having children, and it, it's, it's just a thing. And I invested a lot in it, but it's worth less to me now than it was before. I think the difference between a good investor and a, and a great investor, got some investors in this room, um, don't take my financial advice. A good investor knows what's valuable today, but a great investor knows what's valuable tomorrow. And I think all of us can look back at life and, th and there are things that we valued that no longer have value for us today. And the question that I want to wrap up with, and I'm going to give you some time to think about this and really ponder it, what is going to be treasure for you in 100 years? What's really going to matter 
not today, not even tomorrow, but in a hundred years. What is going to be your treasure? Because my treasure when I was eight was different than my treasure when I was 15. It was different from my treasure when I was 20. It was different from my treasure when I was 25. And it's different from my treasure now. And I promise you, I'm going to have different treasures when I'm 50, 60, 70, Lord willing, I make it. You see, part of the beautiful discernment is for us to wrestle with what really has value. And do we really believe, church, do we really believe that there is a great pearl of greatest cost, of greatest value, that that treasure can be received? And I, I find myself, as I, as I think about this parable and my my. Flesh wants to, of course, judge this guy. How could you miss out on the opportunity to follow Jesus? But, you know, that's a macrocosm of a microcosm, I think, that we experience daily and even weekly, in which Jesus says, will you give me, will you, will you surrender this to have this? Will you, will you give of your time, which is a treasure to you now, to spend time with me and build a treasure in heaven? Will you surrender of finance now to invest it in me to have a treasure in heaven? Will you, will you give of your prayers and your effort and your attention and your compassion now in order to build a treasure in heaven? It's this question that comes to us again and again and again. It's so easy to walk away and say, oh, I'll just take the bird in hand because the bird in hand is worth two in a bush. Well, not if you actually have the two in the bush, then it's worth twice as much. <laughs> But I do think one of the greatest challenges and the the greatest challenge that this man was faced with was that he had to believe that the promise of Jesus had greater value than what he had contained already. For where your heart is, or where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And this man put his head down, became sad, and walked away because where did he go? He returned to his treasure. We will not be separated from our treasure in eternity. Just let that statement settle for a minute. We will not be separated from our treasure in eternity. Where does our true treasure lie? I'm going to ask Daniel to come up, and I want to, I'm going to just have him play for just a couple minutes, and I really want you to think about this. Maybe come up with three things. Pull out your phone, pull out your pen. I want you to write, write them down. Um, shoot for three, but if you got more, or if you can't <clears throat> think of three. Um, but here's the question. What is going to be my greatest treasure in 100 years? What is going to be my greatest treasure in a hundred years. I'll give you some time. Before we sing, I want to take some time in prayer. And uh, I'm going to give you just about a minute to look at your own list and to begin to ask the Lord for discernment 
about what you can do to store that treasure up. It's his reward. We can't control, <laughs> right? But can the Lord give us discernment to store those things up? How do we participate in it? And so I want to just give you a minute. Will you, with your list with the Lord, what does it look like for me to store up this treasure? Lord Jesus, help us to have discernment on this treasure hunt called life to know what has the greatest value. For even in our own lives, we have seen those who have invested in things that turn out to have no value in their lives and in the lives of others. I ask that you would bring these things to our mind and to our hearts as we go forth, that we would not be investing in today, that we wouldn't even be investing in tomorrow. That you would give us eternal eyes to see that which has value in your kingdom and in the age to come. Teach us, Lord, how we can be participants in storing up these treasures in heaven. And Lord, as we count the cost in our own life, help us to remember that Jesus Christ he paid the ultimate price to store up for us that we are his treasure. And what was he willing to give for treasure in heaven? Give us loose hands, Lord, to loosen the treasures of this earth that we may obtain the pearl of greatest price. Help us to see, Lord Jesus. Amen. Would you please stand? In the morning, when I rise, in the morning, when I rise, in the morning, when I rise, give me Jesus, give me Jesus.
die Oh, when I come to die Oh, when I come to die Give me Jesus quickly read the rest of the story for you here. You can, you can see the man in your mind's eye as he puts his head down and he begins to walk away. And Jesus looks to his disciples and says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. They saw it in living color. He said, then Peter said to him, Behold, but Jesus, we've left everything and followed you. What will there be for us? And Jesus said, Truly I say to you, that whoever you, who, who, those of you who have followed me, in the regeneration, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, and judging the twelve tribes of Israel, everyone who has left houses or brothers, or sisters, or, fam or fathers, or mothers, or children, or farms, for my name's sake, will receive many times as much, and will inherit eternal life. For many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Lord, we live in a generation in which value is so confusing. And the world is constantly lying to us, telling us what has great value. And we ask that you would instruct our hearts as to what truly matters. Teach us what true treasure in heaven is. But I pray for these things that were written down. And we ask that even now, Lord, we would be storing them up for the eternal treasure which awaits those who faithfully await for your return. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.